Well, it's a, it's a privilege for me to be with you, and um, especially um, on today, given it's uh, Father's Day, to be able to speak, and more, even doubly so, because of the baptisms we just witnessed, which is always something which I just simply love being present at. And uh, as I was actually getting ready for this, uh, this message, I've been, if you just heard, I've been doing a lot of travel recently. I've been over to Asia twice and into Europe twice in the last four weeks alone. And as I was getting ready for this one, I was, I was suddenly remembered of a story which is told about a, a uh, Church of England vicar, actually, who'd been asked to make a national address on Mother's Day. And uh, Radio Forward basically said, look, you've got four minutes, um, and it's going to be in the afternoon, and this is where you need to be. And he, the, uh, the guy who'd been asked to do this thought, well, what a wonderful opportunity. I'm definitely going to take that up. And so he said yes, and, but as the time got nearer and nearer and nearer, he began to worry more and more and more about what he was going to say. Uh, so much so that he began to fall into a panic, and every single time he got out a sheet of paper and a pen thinking, what would I say to the nation for four minutes on Mother's Day, he, he, he was just completely stumped. Nothing was coming through. Anyway, the morning came of the Sunday where he was going to be making the broadcast that evening. He still didn't have any ideas. So he suddenly remembered, actually, that there was a very, very popular church not very far from where he was, and he thought that maybe he would go there on the morning, sit in the back, and see what the guy said on Mother's Day in his church and see if it gave him any ideas. Anyway, the, uh, the church leader came up to the front, um, sort of trendy looking guy, jeans, red check shirt, and <laughs> he looks out into his congregation and he says, and these were his opening words. He said, this morning, I found myself in the embrace of a woman who was not my wife. Well, you could have cut the atmosphere like a knife. <laughs> there was a sharp intake of breath People leant forward in their seats, and then he said, it was my mother. And everybody went, ah. Oh. And the vicar at the back of the church thought, that is brilliant. <laughs> that's, that's how I'm going to start. So at the end of the service, he runs out, he grabs some paper, he grabs some pen, he, he starts using this as an opening thought, and all kinds of ideas are coming. He's desperately trying to put them into some kind of order, and as he does that, he, at one point, suddenly looks at his watch and realizes he's late. So he simply grabs all the papers, grabs his notes, grabs his Bible and, and, a, and a notebook, and he jumps in his car, he drives to where he needs to go to this remote radio station, and he comes in, he's been caught up in traffic, he's now running very, very late, and they, as soon as they see him, they grab him, they say, thank goodness you're here, they stick him, stick him in a booth, they shut the door, and the red light comes on. He's now live. And he's still, he still hasn't got his notes in order, they're still all over the place, and but there's dead air. And so the, you can see the guys from outside the booth pointing at the microphone, you know, speak. So he starts to speak. And he says, this morning, I found myself in the embrace of a woman who was not my wife. And at that point, he drew a blank. <laughs> he just couldn't remember what the next bit was. And so he's fumbling around in his bag looking for his notes. And he he can't find those properly, and he just puts his head in his hands, and he mumbles into the microphone. But for the life of me, I, I can't remember who it was. <laughs> anyway, hopefully we'll have minimal confusion this evening. Now, what I'm going to do uh, this evening with you is I would like to address um, a question that sometimes comes up when people are either thinking about belief in God or discussing those who seem to have found belief in God. Now, this morning, we, we took a different question. We were looking at the question about the nature of God's love and why is it that the loving God that we read about in the Bible is also seems to be a God who passes judgment and stuff like that. Whereas today, what I'd like to do is, is raise a slightly different question that exists for other people, and it works a bit like this. Look, people who believe in God, they believe in God because they, they need to. They seem to have some kind of emotional need or vacuum, and that need is somehow met in this belief in a God. Now that belief isn't real, but it has a real effect. And this really explains, if you like, the psychology behind all of this. It's our, it's our need for acceptance, it's our need for love, it's our need for all of these things. And you can see it, especially if you go to one of those happy clappy churches, and you may have discovered to your dismay if you're visiting that you are in one. <laughs> Don't try leaving early, you'll find the doors are locked. <laughs> and it is simply confirming everything that you thought up until this point, and you even listened to the testimonies. And you thought, well, these things sound very emotional, very relational, very, well, 
this is the point I find myself in, and somehow God has met me there. Now, there are two things just to, to say about this just before I come in, and I would like to try to explain to you why this response of emotion that Christians often, often show. But before just going there, I'd just like to deal with this whole felt need question. Because it's clearly the case that just because we feel a need for something doesn't mean that thing isn't there. As a matter of fact, it could even be fatal. For example, if you suddenly dropped and had no sense of need to eat anymore, it's not just the fact at that point that you could survive without eating, you'll actually die. That will kill you. So it's not, we can't simply say, look, well, because I, have, I feel I have a need for something, it means I should be suspicious of what I, of the felt need I have. The question is, is it real? Is the need both real and is what meets that need also real? Now, Freud very famously argued, look, God is basically some kind of psychological projection. And in some of his writings, he says that we live in an unpredictable world and we're surrounded by unpredictable forces. And so we create an exalted father figure in whom we can put our need and our trust. Now, very interestingly, a couple of very famous uh, psychiatrists in this world have couple, recently written books, some in North America, some in Germany. As a matter of fact, one of Germans, Germany's leading psychiatrists in which he basically says it's very interesting. If you take some of the key atheists from the 20th century and you look at them as a psychiatrist, you'll find that many of them had abusive, weak, or absent fathers. And so his conclusion is that atheism is a form of psychological denial. Now, is belief in God a psychological projection that meets you at a point of felt need? Or is atheism a point of psychological denial? You don't want God to exist because of other, for other reasons. Now, the only way to choose between those two possibilities is on the basis of reality. If there is no God and you come to believe in him, well, clearly it's projection. If there is a God and you're insistent on denying him, then it's clearly denial. How do we discern between those two? Psychology and psychiatry will not help at this point. Truth and reality is the only means by which we can employ at that point to decide between those two competing explanations, because they both work. They are both potentially valid, depending on what the reality is. Now, the other thing just to say about um, felt needs as well is that some people have concluded that we can decide the question about, well, is God really there or not, simply on the basis of science. Now, I don't have time to go into all of this in detail. Two of my, my colleagues, um, both of them have been professors at Oxford University at a variety of times. John Lennox and Alistair McGrath have written a lot on this, published a lot on this. Alistair McGrath was here a couple of weeks ago speaking. I don't know if he was on this or on something else. And I would urge you simply to go online and either listen to something that they've said or buy one of their numerous books. But we're going to have to be very careful if you want to conclude that because we now understand the laws of science, that we can safely conclude that there is no God. I'd like to suggest to you actually the opposite may be the case. Now, a very well-known writer by the name of C.S. Lewis, he put it this way. He said, look, we all understand the laws of mathematics. We all know that two plus two equals four. He says, let's suppose one day you come home from work having had a long day's night, you know, working hard into the evening, and you come to your bedside table and you do what you always do. You, you take off your watch, you put it on your bedside table, you take off your belt and everything else, and then you take out your wallet, as is your custom, and you take all the spare cash that's inside your wallet, let's say 2,000 pounds. <laughs> you put it in the bedside table, you put your wallet on the top of the table. He says, the next morning, he says, you go out to work, you do exactly the same thing, and that evening you come back and you go through the same routine. You take off your watch as you're getting ready for bed, you put it on your bedside table, you take off everything else, you take out your wallet of your back pocket as you're getting undressed, you remove all the spare change from your wallet, another 2,000 pounds. <laughs> this is a Goldman Sachs story. And <laughs> you put it in your bedside table. He says, now, on the third morning, you wake up and you decide to take all the loose change out of your bedside table. How much money should be there? Okay, that's four of you who are <laughs> confident enough to say that. 4,000 pounds. But you open the drawer and you find there's only 1,000 pounds in there. What do you conclude? You know, I was giving this illustration in Hong Kong about three years ago. And I said to the audience, what do you conclude? And a man from the very back yelled out, my wife has gone shopping. <laughs> now, when you open the drawer, you are expecting to find 4,000 pounds there. If there is only 1,000 pounds, you realize and you can safely conclude that someone has come in from the outside and stolen 3,000 pounds. You don't open the drawer and go, oh, the laws of mathematics have been broken. <laughs> no, the laws of the land have been broken. Someone took 3,000 pounds from your drawer. That's the problem. 
How do we detect the presence of the thief? It is because we understand the laws of mathematics, and because we live in a mathematically regulated universe, we can safely come to that conclusion. If sometimes two plus two equals one, you couldn't safely come to that conclusion. But, says Lewis, it would be ridiculous to try to argue against the existence or presence of a thief because you believe that such a character was breaking the laws of mathematics. The laws of mathematics reveal this outside intervention. So if you're trying to argue on the basis of science and because we understand scientific law that this somehow precludes God because God would be breaking the laws of nature every time he intervened or did a miracle, well, that would be, that's crazy. Such a being could only be revealed and his presence could only be detected because we live in such a world. It is because we live in a world that is governed by physical law and mathematical regulation that we're able to tell when someone has stepped in and intervened. So don't be too, hurry, too hasty to run to the conclusion that this God somehow doesn't exist and therefore you're very safe with the psychological projection thesis. It is only because we live in such a scientifically regulated universe that we can detect the presence possibly of miracles and then ask the question whether anyone's intervened. Outside of that, we wouldn't even be able to get that far. So don't be too hasty there. Now, having said all of that and just talked about need, what I'd like to do is take one instance in Jesus' life and try to explain to you why it is that Christians respond to the person of Christ in the way they do. And what's going to come up uh, behind us is a story from the Gospel of Luke, and this is from chapter 7. And let me just tell you what's happening here. Jesus Christ is walking around, and he's doing and saying various things that people are rather surprised by. And in this instant in Jesus' life, a Pharisee, one of the religious leaders of Jesus' time, invites him to come and have a meal with him. And we're going to just look at this, this story together for the next little while. This won't take more than three or four hours. <laughs> when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Now, um, actually, if we were reading this in the original language it was written in, which was, which was Greek, I, I was once handing out Bibles in a um, as part of a church outreach to a particular area, and I gave the guy a Bible. He says, this is the original Bible. Now, I was a little bit naughty because I, I, uh, I knew what he meant by that was the King James Version. And I said, oh, actually, no, because not many people read New Testament Greek anymore. He said, not that's what I, not what I meant. You know full well. I meant the original translation. I said, oh, sadly not. Not many people read Latin either. So <laughs> this is, this is, uh, this is, I have to sort of just not correct this a little bit. I'm going to, Whenever you translate something, you have to translate it in a way so people actually understand what you're saying. So you're probably listening to me now thinking, gosh, translation would be wonderful. I'd love to understand what he's saying. <laughs> now, when you're translating from one language to another, you, you sometimes insert phrases and words so people understand. Now, what it literally says, if you were reading it in the Greek, it would say, he came in and reclined. Now, we don't translate it that way for most English translations because that gives the impression that he came to the Pharisee's house and then lay down to have a little nap. Okay. Now, but whereas that phrase, to recline, basically means, yes, you get invited, you come along for dinner. And dinner is served in the middle of the floor on a large rug. There are cushions all the way around the outside. Everybody comes and you tuck your feet underneath you because it's very rude to put someone on the sole of your feet. You recline on one side and you reach over into the middle of this carpeted area where all the common dishes are and you break off a piece of bread and you just grab whatever you want, meat, dips, and so on. Make sense? That's what it means to sort of recline, right? So it doesn't mean he came to have a nap. That's why we say he reclined at the table, just in case. But even that can sound a little bit strange because if someone came to your table and reclined on it, you may be a little upset for dinner, <laughs> right? But he's reclining and that means he's coming to eat, all right? Okay. And a woman in that town who had lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. Now, let's just say just a little bit about this to help to set the scene here. This woman is given two identifiers, two means by which we can identify the kind of person she is. Okay. One, she is a sinner. Now, what that basically means is, look, as one of our guys said, I've been a little bit naughty. <laughs> but she's been naughty in a way which makes her rather notorious. Okay, so she's a well-known one of these. And the second one, and the reason why we can guess at her, at her, at her um, profession, is that she comes and she has an alabaster jar of perfume. Now, in the Middle East, I grew up in the Middle East. Um, I spent most of my childhood in Saudi Arabia. Um, so I grew up myself hearing nothing about the Christian gospel. If you work as a prostitute, um, one of the main challenges is, is basically 
There's a shortage of water. Water's very expensive. There's no problem with salt water. There's a lot of that kicking around around the coastal areas, um, as there would have been in Israel. Um, but fresh water is a bit more challenging. So you don't bath as regularly as you might do now. Some of you probably do need to be bathing more regularly, um, but the pastoral team here will come and speak to you afterwards. <laughs> but you can't bath as much as you would like to, ideally. And so prostitutes would wear an alabaster jar. Now, what's special about an alabaster jar? Well, alabaster jars are porous. They leak. And so what you would do is you'd buy a very expensive perfume, like a white nard. So it looks like lard, except please don't cover yourself in lard. Uh, <laughs> That will attract a different type of interest. <laughs> you will take this, it looks like lard, it's a solid white perfume. You, you push it into the jar and you cork it. The heat from your body melts it. And as it slowly melts, it perfumes the whole body through the porous holes in the jar. It's the basic tool of the trade for a prostitute. And it is exceptionally expensive. Very, very, very expensive. Now, so this woman comes. And you may be asking yourself, well, what on earth is she doing there at all? Well, let me just explain that too, just so we can get the setting to the story right. As a religious leader, one of the things that you're required to do is to give alms to other people. You have to be generous to others. And one of the ways you do that is by giving of money, but also by extending hospitality. So at these feasts, if you ever had someone important to come, you would have your invited guests who would come and recline on the cushions. But the uninvited guests, anyone could simply show up and they were allowed to stand around the outside of the room and listen in on the conversation. And because it's incumbent upon the host to make sure there's more than enough food, okay, we, we like eating a lot in this part of the world. Um, hence my family motto, life is too short to be thin. Um, <laughs> after all the invited guests have finished reclining and eating, the uninvited guests who are allowed to stand around the outside of the room, uh, around the edges of the room listening in, are then allowed to come and hoover up whatever food may be left. So thereby they benefited both from the com company and also from the conversation and then from the food. So you are now basically, it's a way of having, if you like, like an open home to fulfill that requirement to give and to give alms. So that's what's going on here. And as she stood behind him at his feet, we weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Now this seems to be slightly over-emotional. Jesus walks in, the woman bursts into tears, and then lets her tears run onto his feet. We're going to come back to that at the moment. Let's just move on down through the story. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured the perfume on them. And when the Pharisee who invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who was touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Now, let's just stop there. What on earth is going on? Jesus Christ has come into the world. Some people are claiming that he is God, the Messiah. He is doing things that no human being should be able to do. People who are born blind can see. People who are lame start walking. The dead are going to be raised to life. And the question is, well, who is this guy? Now, the one thing that everyone is agreed about is if Jesus Christ is God, the one thing he should be is morally upright and pure. There's no disagreement about that. Does that make sense? In the same way that if you were to meet God, you would expect them to be perfect, morally perfect. They, they too, exactly that's where they are. And so the Pharisee is watching this scene unfold. Jesus walks in. This woman bursts into tears. Her tears run off her cheeks onto the feet of Jesus Christ. She lets down her hair and she starts to clean the feet. We're going to come back to this in a minute. It's very important. And then she takes this alabaster jar of perfume and she breaks it, which is the only way to get the perfume out of it, and she covers his feet with this incredibly expensive perfume. The religious leader is watching all of this. And he thinks to himself, wait a minute, wait a minute. If Jesus Christ were a prophet, if he were a holy man, he would automatically know, even though he doesn't live here, that this woman is a notorious bad person. Now, there's a play on words here because the verb to touch is the same verb you use when you touch a flame to light a fire. So it can have a sexual connotation. It's where the English phrase, you know, to set someone on fire in terms of, you know, to burn with passion comes from because so much biblical language and imagery has formed our own language. And so he's basically saying, ooh, Jesus is allowing this woman to touch him and this is very intimate and what is going on here? 
Now, he doesn't say this out loud. He says it to himself. So he thinks in himself all of that. If Jesus were a prophet, he would know, and so on. And Jesus knows what he's thinking without him saying it out loud. Now, this is disturbing. <laughs> many men, this is why many men live in fear of their wives. They also seem to have this ability, <laughs> a time to discern what they're thinking, even though they haven't said it. And so Jesus looks at this guy and calls him by name. Simon, he says, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Let's keep going. Two people owed money to a certain moneylender. This is not a popular subject for talking. Think tax. One owed 500 denarii, the other 50. One basically owes 500 days wages. In other words, they're, almost, they're over two years in debt of their total wage. The other one owes 50, two months in debt of their wage. Neither of them have the money to pay back. Then Jesus asks a question. So he forgives the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? And the answer is, well, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt, he will be the one who loves the most. And Jesus says, you judge correctly. Now, what's going on here? Just notice the order. What comes first, forgiveness or love? Forgiveness comes first. Two people are in debt. Neither of them have the means to pay back. They are both forgiven their debt. What is the response once the debt has been forgiven? The answer is love. And who will have the greater love? Who will have the greater passion? Well, the one who has been forgiven the most is going to have that greater love, that greater passion. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, now, this is very important. Have you ever noticed that when you read something, Tone is really important. I'm sure you've noticed that. So, like, you knock on my door, I open the door. There's a difference between me saying, hi, and hi. <laughs> Those aren't the same, are they? Tone changes meaning dramatically. It's one of the great challenges you have when you're reading anything. How was it spoken? And you have the same challenge when you're reading the Bible. When Jesus said things, is he saying them happily, jokerly, as a, as a comment, sarcastically, seriously? Is he talking with a raised voice? Is he talking softly? Well, here we know exactly how he's talking. He turns to the woman. So the woman who has been weeping and letting her tears fall onto his feet, he now turns and looks at her, but he's speaking to Simon. Do you think he's yelling at the woman? No. So very gently, but very firmly, he says, I came into your house. He's talking to Simon, remember, but he's looking at the woman. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Let's just stop there. Every culture has a little routine, a tradition for dinner time. In England, it works like this. Ding dong, they ring the bell. What do you do? You open the door. The next thing you say is, Come in. The next thing you say is, can I take your coat? Because it's always raining and cold, even when it's the summer. <laughs> and so, and then after that you say, would you like a drink? And after that you say, please have a seat. Now in this culture, the way it works is, when you arrive, you are greeted with a kiss. Okay, that's how you say hello. Men, women, and so on, you kiss. Normally, maybe three, four, potentially five or six times on the cheek, backwards and forwards. And we're not just talking about air kisses. <laughs> hey? We are talking about something much more passionate than that. If you go to church in the Middle East, when they said, say hi to somebody like that happened in here, you do not turn around, shake someone's hand and say hi. You put your arms around them and you give them at least three kisses as a sign of peace and welcome. A friend of mine was visiting England once, came to a church, forgot where he was. <laughs> the man said, let us all offer one another a sign of peace. He turned around, there was a lady behind him, so he kissed her on one cheek, went to kiss the other cheek, but she froze. So instead of turning her head, she stayed the same, he kissed her full on the lips. <laughs> At this point, her husband turned around. This was a confusing situation, believe me. You give a kiss. That's the first thing you do. The next thing you do is you give everybody water for their feet. Why? Well, it's a hot and dusty climate. People wear sandals. They walk around in open sandals. 
People in this country sometimes walk around in open sandals, but that's because they need professional help. In warm countries, you walk around in open sandals because otherwise your feet get hot and smelly. Here's the problem. The roads are made of dirt. They are hot and dusty. So your feet get sweaty, the roads are dusty, you have camels, donkeys and horses walking up and down the roads, they tend to do things as they walk up and round, it gets, dries out very quickly, it gets ground into the dust, the roads, obviously you can't wash them because they're made of dirt, okay? All of that dust, as you walk around and your feet get sweaty, they stick to your feet. Now, when you go to eat at someone's house, you recline. You lie down on one side, you tuck your feet underneath you. Traditional attire would be if you're growing up in this part of the world, you wear long flowing robes all the way down to the floor. So imagine, you're invited to someone's house. You recline. To recline, you lie on one side, you tuck your feet underneath you, and you rest your bottom on your feet. That's traditional po posure. But they are hot and sweaty and covered in this kind of mud and other stuff. When you stand up, what does your backside look like? <laughs> it looks like you have had an accident. Therefore, when you arrive, you take your sandals off and water is provided, and as a minimum, you wash your feet. As a minimum. You wash them, you dry them, you enter the home, and then you recline on the cushions. Jesus Christ has given poignantly no water for his feet. Now, there's something that you never do in the Middle East, and that's criticize someone else's hospitality. You don't do that. As a matter of fact, you don't do that in England, too. Now, I know that some people go around to people's houses for dinner, and they're halfway through eating the first course, and they say, oh, this is terrible. But those people only tend to be invited once. <laughs> you simply do not say anything. And now the guy who was complaining about this woman now starts to take Simon to task for his deliberate failure to be hospitable. As a minimum, he should have been greeted. Hello, he isn't. As a minimum, he should be given water for his feet. He isn't. Imagine you were invited to someone's house for dinner. They open the door, you walk straight into the main living room, and in front of all the guests, the guy goes, oh, it's you. He doesn't offer you a drink. He doesn't take your coat. He doesn't offer you a seat. He doesn't make you feel welcome. What do you conclude about the nature of the invitation? Now, this woman is already there. How do we know she's already there? Well, in the previous slide it said, from the moment I entered this room, this woman hasn't stopped doing this. Now, if I were to say to you, from the moment I walked up here, you have all been looking at me. Who was here first, you or me? Well, you were there first, and from the moment I came up, does that make sense? You were looking at me. This woman is there in the room. She sees how Jesus is treated. And as she sees how she's treated, she bursts into floods of tears, ashamed of the lack of hospitality. She allows the tears to run off her cheeks onto his feet. She takes her hair and she starts scraping all of the mud and dirt and everything off his feet, trying to make up for this lack, this public insult to the person of Jesus Christ. And then she takes the most basic and expensive tool of her trade, breaks it at the feet of Jesus Christ and rubs it into his feet. And Simon thinks this woman is in trouble, the religious guy. The religious guy thinks Jesus is in trouble. Who is the person who's most in trouble in this story? You did not put oil on my head, but she poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. Now, just look at that very carefully. What has happened for this woman first? You see, some people think that the Christian gospel goes something like this. You think you have a need for God. You think you have a need to love God. Somehow you think that God will somehow meet this need. So you want to do nice things for him, and you want to make him happy in the belief that somehow he will then be nice to you and do good things for you, which is why you might go to church or get baptized or read your Bible. You're constantly trying to somehow please God so that he may be happy with you and accept you. That is not the gospel. That is the opposite of what Christians believe. What Christians believe is that all of us have done something wrong. Now, I don't have time to go into this in a great amount of detail. All I can say is, if you are sat here today and you believe you have never done anything wrong, that you are perfect, the only way out of that state of self-deception is to get married. Now, <laughs> that all of us have done something wrong. 
The message of the gospel is not do nice things for God and he will do nice things for you. The message of the gospel is, is that while we were still sinners, while we were still in the wrong, he loved us first. He offers us forgiveness first. And when you receive that forgiveness, the response is love. Her sins have been forgiven. That's actually the correct rendering of the tense here. It's in the past tense. Jesus doesn't look at this woman and say, you are now forgiven. He says, Simon, this woman's sins have been forgiven. She has already heard Jesus Christ talk about forgiveness and the new life you can have in him. And in some way, in some response, she's already said yes. She knows forgiveness in her life. It has completely changed and transformed her. And when she sees the one who made forgiveness in her own life possible being maltreated in this way, she breaks down into tears, she weeps, her tears run off her face onto the feet, and she starts trying to compensate for this public insult. Simon's problem is he doesn't see a woman who has been forgiven. He sees a prostitute who he thinks cannot be forgiven. And sadly, sometimes, it's the religious people, sometimes even the church, who made those who are in the most amount of trouble feel the least welcome. I remember talking, um, we have a project, various projects around the world that we support where we simply just give money to that we have no connection to simply to support them. And one of them rescues out to women who are trapped in life's style of prostitution and it makes it possible for them to have an education so they can take a different profession. This woman retrained as a chef the country and the city in which she now lives, she's a very well-known chef. But for many years, she'd been locked into servitude as a prostitute. And when someone was talking to her and said, well, have you started going to a church yet? She said, if I went to a church, would the people there see me as a woman? Or would they simply refer to me as a former prostitute? It's very interesting when we think about a word that we don't use anymore in this world. It's called sin. We don't like the word sin because it sounds like it's very morally judgmental. But the effect of sin on any human being is disastrous. A few years ago, two years ago, I was speaking in North America in the South, and well, I was in Memphis, and my father had come with me. My father's a big Elvis fan. And while we were there, and I, while I was speaking, the host said to me, have you been to the Civil Rights Museum in Memphis? I said, no. He said, you should go while you're here. So my father and I, on the morning we have off, we drive and we park the car, we start walking to this museum. And as we're walking to the museum, I noticed this motel, it says, motel outside and I'm looking at this motel and I'm thinking I, I recognize this place I'm hundred percent sure I've never been here before but how do I recognize this place well it's the motel in which Martin Luther King was killed the famous shot of the balcony I've seen it in books that's why I recognized it so we walk into the museum and at one point, I lose my father, and I turn around, and I can see he is looking at a giant photograph that takes over a whole wall. And it's a sign of a group of men, rubbish collectors, walking out of the rubbish collection depot, and they're going on strike. And as these men go out on strike, these African-American men, all of them have a square sign around their shoulder on, on which are written only four words. I am a man. Here's a group of people going on strike for no other reason than to be recognized as human beings. My tears were simply pouring out of my father's eyes. And I'm never going to forget that moment. The effect of sin on us is it dehumanizes us. It makes us think of ourselves as objects and other people as objects. Now, the relationship between you and an object is different between the relationship between persons. The relationship between persons is one of connection. But the relationship between you and an object is one of consumption. You consume an object for your own pleasure or your own convenience. This is why, even though it is spectacularly untrendy, the church is so bothered by things like pornography, which simply turns other people into objects to be consumed to such an extent now that in the Western world, sex is no longer about connection between people, but one of consumption, where you consume the other for your own pleasure or for your own purposes. So widespread has this become that we even started to think of ourselves as objects and we try to market ourselves. 
to other people. He looks at this woman and all he sees is an object. And Jesus Christ looks at this woman and what he sees is a person who's in need of forgiveness. She has received that forgiveness and now she has fallen desperately in love with the person of Christ. She is not forgiven because she loved him. She has been forgiven. That's why her love is so intense. Then Jesus says to her, your sins are forgiven. He simply reinforces. And the other guests began to say, who is this who even forgives sins? And Jesus said to this woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. What does this mean? Why is it that this church expresses itself with such joy? Why is it that some of the people who get into the baptism tool break down into tears as they're, as they're being baptized. Why? Why the strength of emotion? Now, in England, we sometimes say, look, this isn't very English. We're not Middle Easterners here. We're English people. We respond with more measured emotional ways to these kinds of events. Now, I've heard that argument many times. It seems to break down when you're watching football. <laughs> when all of a sudden, the ball goes into the back of the net, men start crying, running around, hugging and kissing each other. So the emotional repression simply works out in other ways. If you know that you are in need of forgiveness, and if you also know that you are absolutely undeserving of forgiveness, and you suddenly find that you have been forgiven, the only response you make is one of love. You fall in love of that person. And this loving relationship, which you heard about through every testimony, is at the center of the Christian faith. And it brings joy. Now, this does bother some people for two reasons. One, and let me just take these from a writer called John Piper. One, yes, but the Christian faith is about duty, isn't it? There are things that you should do, things that you shouldn't do. You keep a stiff upper lip and you do the right thing, right? It's all about duty. It's not about joy. Well, sort of. Look, I'm away from my family a lot. I travel around the world, as you heard earlier. I tend to be away 100 days a year. There's a huge florist shop at the top of my road. Often when I come home, I buy my wife flowers. So imagine I've been away for a while. I stop. I buy my wife flowers. I come walk down the road. I put, my, put the flowers by the side of the door so she can't see them. And I knock on the door. She opens the door. And she smiles at me. And I grab the flowers. And I go, ta-da, these are for you. And she takes these flowers. And she goes, they're beautiful, Michael. They're so expensive. Why did you do it? And I say, it was my duty. <laughs> There's something profoundly deficient in that answer. <laughs> because a duty that's devoid of joy in that sense is actually not honoring at all. Now, other people say, yes, okay, but if you do this because somehow you delight in it too, then that's also wrong as well, isn't it? Because that makes it selfish. That makes it all about you. You do this for God because it makes you feel happy. Well, that's not thinking about it very clearly either. Let's suppose I've been away. I buy my wife flowers. I knock on the door. She opens the door. Ta-da! These are for you. She takes the flowers. She looks at them and says, Michael, these flowers, they're beautiful. You, you shouldn't have. Why did you? And I say, because I know how happy it makes you. And nothing makes me ha more happy than making you happy. As a matter of fact, I've booked a table at our favorite restaurant tonight, and I've arranged a babysitter, because nothing else would give me more pleasure. There's nothing I would rather do tonight than spend the evening alone with you. Now, when I say that to her, she never looks at me and says, what do you mean there's nothing you wouldn't rather do? Why don't you think about me sometime? You're so selfish. <laughs> she doesn't say that because it is the nature of love to delight yourself in the other. It is the nature of love to delight yourself in the other. That is a sign that a relationship is good. When that is no longer the case, then that means that something's gone wrong in that relationship. If at the heart of the Christian faith there is a living, loving relationship with God, what is the appropriate response in it and through it and because of it? And the answer is joy. But it's stronger than that. Your faith has saved you, he has said. Let me just conclude with this and then the band will come up and deliver you from my machinations. <laughs> Let's supposing the end of this talk, I said, let's have a time of public Q&A, which I sometimes do. And the first question is asked by the leader of this particular church. And after he's finished asking his question, I look at him and I say, I think that's a very stupid question. You 
have the intellectual capacity more commonly associated with forms of pond life, which are invisible to the naked eye. In case you're wondering, that's from Blackadder. Now, Sir Blackadder. Now, let's supposing that that's my response to the question, for some strange reason, it's taken as an insult. <laughs> and you walk out of the church this evening, shaking your head, thinking, wow. Exciting baptisms, mediocre talk, but what a way to end. <laughs> I'm not going to forget that in a hurry. Well, the next morning, you're in London, you're in downtown, and you see me in a Starbucks having a coffee, and you can't resist it. You come up, you say, you're Michael. I say, yeah. You say, I, I saw you last night, this evening, Christchurch, London, baptism service. I go, oh, yeah. And then you look at me and you say, how's your relationship with, with the leader of that church? And tears come into my eyes. And I say to you, it's the closest and most meaningful relationship I have in the world right now. <laughs> now, what would you make of that response? I mean, I'd have to have the intellectual and emotional capacity of a carrot <laughs> to believe that could possibly be true. But there is one set of circumstances in which that is completely true. Let's suppose in having insulted and lied about the leader of this church in front of everybody here, that after you all left, he came up to me and put his arms around me and said, Michael, I, uh, I have no idea why you said what you said earlier. Can we talk? And as he talks with me, and we go long into the night, I break down in tears. And I say, I'm so sorry. I, I can't believe I made up those things about you. I said, I don't know what's going on in my life right now. I... And it becomes very clear through his action to me that he wants to forgive me. And as I experience that grace, as I experience that offer of forgiveness, at that point when I say, I'm sorry, I receive that forgiveness. That is how you receive forgiveness. If someone is willing to forgive you, but you're not prepared to say sorry because you think you've done nothing wrong, you can't receive it. If you want to be forgiven and the other person isn't willing to forgive you, you can't be forgiven. There's no hope for reconciliation. But if the person you have wronged wants to forgive you, and you're willing to say sorry, you receive that forgiveness. And it's amazing. Have you ever had this experience? You've wronged someone, maybe even accidentally, and you apologize to them, and they forgive you. The next time you see them, you know within one nanosecond whether you've been forgiven. Have you ever noticed that? You can walk into the room, and you can tell immediately whether they've forgiven you or not. It's strange. You have peace in their presence. And if that's what happened to me that night, and now, six hours later, after 2 a.m., after I've been left, back in London, and you come up to me and you say, Michael, what's your relationship with the church leader at Christ Church? And I say, it's the closest and most meaningful relationship I have in the world right now. I may not be lying at all. It may be a complete statement of truth and fact. But here's the amazing thing. Why can I be so sure of it? It's not because I've tried to earn my way back into his favor. That would be an uneasy piece. It's not because I'm trying to ignore something that went wrong and I'm hoping it will go away. That makes for an even more uneasy piece. The reason why I know I'm forgiven is that the offer of forgiveness was made and I trusted that promise. I took it at face value and it turned out to be real. And the next time I see him, there's a complete peace between us. Go in peace. Your faith has saved you. Jesus Christ offers us peace and forgiveness. That's his promise. And we, when we say yes to him, and when we say sorry, we receive the forgiveness he offers. There's complete peace with him. There is no arrogance. There is no boasting. Just a certain knowledge that you're now in a right relationship, in the right place. And it's there, not because of anything you have done, but because you put your faith, your trust in his promise. And our response to that is joy. I hope that makes sense. Please forgive me. I've spoken slightly longer than I wanted to. So wake up the person next to you. The band is going to come back up. I think sing one last closing song. And I hope that this has made sense to you. Thank you for living to, listening to me, even though I'm very tired. And I really hope you enjoy the rest of this evening and that you'll have enough to think about uh, for the, over the next few hours as you go home. Bless you.